Welcome to the hearing on unleashing America's economic potential. For the eight years prior to this new administration, we were told that America could never do better than 2% growth. We were told that such sluggish growth was the new normal and that we had to lower our expect expectations. And this contradicted what we knew about America. We all knew America is an economic powerhouse and we're blessed with vast and bountiful land, massive energy resources, and most importantly, the American people. Our dreams as a nation don't rely on government fiat or foreign influence, but on the resourcefulness, the innovativeness, and the hard work of everyday working Americans. And the question is, will we as elected officials of the U.S. government allow them to work towards their dreams and fully contribute to our nation's prosperity? And this hearing is just about that. How is it, for instance, that we have just seen a remarkably good job growth for the last few months? Listen to these numbers. We're averaging 214,000 more jobs for February and March, and the employment to population ratio is held steady. The unemployment rate has remained stable at 4.1% for six months, the lowest since 2000. And meanwhile, average hourly earnings continue their upward trend. And it wasn't long ago we were told not to expect this. In fact, we were told to lower our expectations. And I'll explain. As an example, when my daughters set goals, these goals are generally beyond where they are at the time, at the current time. Maybe they want to get better at math or science. Maybe they want to read more books than before. But the point is, they know their potential, and they set goals beyond where they are currently at because they want to grow. It should be the exact same when we're thinking and talking about our own economy. The first graph that was displayed at our last hearing, the top line is what the Congressional Budget Office thought in 2007 our economy was capable of producing. This is an economy of hope and growth. The bottom line, regrettably, is what our economy in fact produced, our actual real GDP. Now, to be sure, the financial crisis knocked us off our feet. The lines in between are the annual CBO forecasts of our economic potential over the course of the Obama administration. And each year, these forecasts were lowered year by year. This is what it looks like when a nation is urged by its leaders to accept mediocrity and to let the government handle more. More taxes, more regulations, and more control meant that the American economy was being held back. This was a self-fulfilling prophecy. These projections dragged under growing weight of high tax rates and record-setting levels of regulation. Before 2017, economic growth was slow. Employers weren't willing to invest in their businesses or their employees. Productivity and take-home pay stagnated. People in their prime working years stayed out of the workforce, and fewer people were willing to risk starting a business so entrepreneurship fell. Businesses found it more attractive to invest and create jobs overseas where other countries had learned to lower their corporate tax rates and reduce regulations. And at the same time, the federal government's power over nearly every aspect of our lives grew. And yes, there are constructive things that government does, such as keeping us safe, enforcing civil and property rights, and setting rational rules of the road by which the economy could operate efficiently. However, government does not create prosperity. Our people create prosperity by having great ideas, working hard, and having the resources to take a risk on building peace of the American dream. Far too often, government stands in the way of prosperity and opportunity by overtaxing and overregulating. Our country's GDP is based on its workforce, capital stock, and productivity, determined by technology, innovation, and training. It isn't based on how much the government succeeds in redirecting capital. And we're seeing a different course that lists the artificial constraints the government has imposed on the economy. This graph is similar to the one in the report the JEC published last week in response to the economic report of the president. If we lift the government constraints of high taxes and heavy regulation that weighed down our potential, our economic potential can rise. If it rises to what CBO projected as recently even as 2012, there would be plenty of room displayed as the output gap for our economy to grow faster. We've removed government obstacles that prevented Americans from achieving their dreams. When growth is strong, businesses have the confidence to invest. Jobs are plentiful. Potential entrepreneurs become willing to risk starting a business, and American households become more prosperous. And we're already seeing results. Every quarter of economic growth in 2017 outperformed the same quarter in 2016. Business investment is strengthening, and small business confidence is high. Production and investment are coming back to the United States. Paychecks are growing because the government is taking a smaller cut, and businesses are investing in their workers. In my home state of Minnesota, the good news about tax reform keeps pouring in. As companies like Best Buy, Biotechni, CIT, Relay & Switch, Loram, Data Sales, ETN, Hormel, TCF, and U.S. Bank, and others invest in their employees by giving them special bonuses, pay raises, or additional better benefits. But even tailwinds of pro-growth tax and regulatory reform, there still are risks to the economy, such as the newly announced tariffs. Trade is critical to our economic growth. A robust trade agenda is essential for the United States to grow jobs by selling American goods and services around the world, as 96% of the world's consumers live outside of the United States. 
The end goal of trade policy should be to eliminate artificial barriers for the free flow of our goods and our services, not cause new ones. And I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists who are here today uh, as they advise us on other ways to unleash greater opportunity in America. And before I introduce them, I now recognize our ranking member, Senator Heinrich, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm pleased that we have this opportunity today to dig a little deeper into the Republican tax law. It was a complex bill passed without Democratic input and very little debate. The result is a hastily written law that has caused confusion about how families and the broader economy will be impacted. So let me start with a couple of facts. As a result of the Republican tax law, working families will see what little relief they get disappear over time. Corporations will po pocket massive permanent gains. The deficit will soar and Republicans will point to spending as the problem. And the price tag seems to be growing. From $1.5 trillion in December, this week CBO increased the estimate to $1.9 trillion. By adding nearly $2 trillion to the national debt, the tax law gives Republicans a fresh rationale to target Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Before the bill was even signed, Speaker Ryan said, quote, we're going to have to get back next year at entitlement reform, which is how you tackle the debt and the deficit, end quote. And other House Republican leaders, including Majority Leader McCarthy and Majority Whip Scalise, have made similar pledges to do the same. I thought a big part of tackling the debt and the deficit was not wasting nearly $2 trillion on tax breaks for large corporations and wealthy individuals. But that's not how my Republican colleagues see it. To pay for some of their tax giveaways, Republicans want to cut health care coverage that families receive through Medicaid and go after Medicare and Social Security that seniors and their families count on. Let me be clear. Democrats will fight these cuts every step of the way. This week, House Republicans are planning to vote on a so-called balanced budget amendment that would have devastating consequences for seniors, children, and middle-class families. It's all part of the same Republican script. Tax breaks for those who don't need them, followed by a belated call to address the national debt they keep adding to. And this committee, as this committee has discussed, Republicans also promised that their tax law would result in a big, in big yearly wage increases of $4,000 per family, to be precise. Now, there's no question that families across the country desperately need a raise. After adjusting for inflation, the typical workers' wages have grown by only 6% over the past 35 years. It's especially tough in places like New Mexico, where there are fewer jobs today than when the recession began more than a decade ago. And the unemployment rate is at 5.8%, almost 50% higher than the national rate. But the ones who are getting most of the benefits from the tax law are corporate executives and wealthy shareholders. Companies are spending about 30 times as much on stock buybacks as on worker bonuses or wage increases. Why are large companies using their tax savings to lift their stock prices? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Executive compensation is tied directly to the price of company stock. One study found that more than 80% of compensation of the 500 highest paid executives in 2015 came from stock. That's a pretty big incentive for top, top executives to try to get their stock price higher. And there's another piece that's just as concerning. Large buybacks also mean that companies have less leftover for investment in factories, in research and development, all of which drive productivity, job creation, and wage increases over the long term. Now I want to turn to the other focus of today's hearing, reversing critical federal oversight. The, Fed, the administration has rolled back protections for workers, for consumers, and for the environment. Reducing costs is often the stated motivation behind gutting protections, but a new OMB report shows that the regulations issued between 2006 and 2016 resulted in annual benefits that far exceeded the costs benefits of between $287 and $911 billion. Now, there's no question that many recent actions taken by the administration will harm workers and consumers. For example, the Trump administration reversed an increase in the overtime threshold, costing 4 million workers a collective $1.2 billion in additional wages per year. The administration has given payday lenders a green light to engage in predatory lending practices that result in annual interest rates as high as 600%. And Republicans passed a law that reduced the effectiveness of the National Instant Criminal Background System and actually made it easier for people with serious mental illness to buy a firearm. The administration has also gone after the environment and public lands. And at the end of last year, President Trump took action to dramatically reduce the size of Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments, 
pushing aside concerns voiced by tribal communities that these sacred places should be protected and opening up our wildest lands to commercial development. The Oregon Mountains, Desert Peaks, and Rio Grande del Norte National Monuments in New Mexico have also been under threat, despite widespread local support for their creation. Rather than working off a special interest wish list, the administration should work with Democrats to foster inclusive economic growth that helps families pay their bills, afford to go to college, and save for retirement. Thanks to each of you for your testimony today. With that, we'll introduce our witnesses, and we'll start, uh, I'll go through all four witnesses. Dr. Douglas Holtz Egan is the president of the American Action Forum. He also serves as a commissioner on the Congressionally Chartered Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission and outside advisor to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. During 2007 and 2008, he was the director of domestic and economic policy for the John McCain presidential campaign. From 2003 to 2005, he was the sick director of the Congressional Budget Office, addressing the 2003 tax cuts, the Medicare pres prescription drug bill, and Social Security reform. Dr. Holtz Eakin was also the chief economist with the President's Council of Economic Advisors from 2001 to 2002. He holds a PhD in economics from Princeton University and bachelor's in economics and math from Denison University. Thanks for being with us today. Dr. Chad Moutre has served as chief economist for the National Association of Manufacturers since 2011. From 2002 to 2010, he was the chief economist and director of economic research for the Office of Advocacy at the U.S. Small Business Administration. Prior to working at the SBA, he was the dean of the School of Business Administration at Robert Morris College in Chicago, now Robert Morris University of Illinois. Dr. Moutre is a former board member of the National Association for Business Economics, and he's the former president and chairman of the National Econ Economist Club. He holds a PhD also in economics from Southern Illinois University at Carbondale and bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Eastern Illinois University. And we also have a Minnesotan with us here today. Uh, Mr. Richard Hampton is the chairman of the board of Circuit Interruption Technology Incorporated, CIT. It's a family-owned business in Minnesota. His son Jeffrey founded in 1999. Uh, as well and manages now as CEO. Welcome to Washington. Mr. Hampton began his career as material manager for Weatherford Company, a California-based electronic distributor and later became president of Fisher Brownell, a leading switch distributor. He subsequently served as general manager of Carroll Electronics, a leading electronic components parts distributor based in Minnesota. And prior to joining CIT, he was vice president, national sales manager, and president of Electronic Components Group. And our fourth witness today is Dr. Jay Mazur, is Vice President for Tax Policy and Robert C. Posen, Director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center. From 2012 until early 2017, he was the Assistant Secretary for Tax Policy at the U.S. Department of the Treasury. Mazur served in the federal government for 27 years in various positions, including Senior Economist at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Senior Director at the National Economic Council, Acting Administrator of the Energy Information Administration and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Tax Analysis in the Office of Tax Policy. Before entering public service, Mazur was an assistant professor in Heinz College at Carnegie Mellon University. He also holds a PhD in business from Stanford University. And with that, we will welcome each of you to the committee today, and we will begin with Dr. Holtz Egan and just remind all witnesses to limit your <coughs> testimony to five minutes, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Dr. Holtz Egan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Heinrich, and members of the committee. It's a privilege to be here today. Uh, in my oral remarks, I'll make three uh, very straightforward points, uh, and then I look forward to your questions. Uh, as of January 1st, 2017, uh, poor economic growth was the top domestic problem facing the United States. Since then, uh, the tax and regulatory changes, I think, will be quite beneficial for the growth environment. But my third point would be that there are uh, challenges that remain and more work to be done. So let me elaborate on those. Uh, from the end of World War II to 2007, the U.S. economy grew rapidly enough that even with the arrival of the baby boom population, income per person, GDP per capita, doubled roughly every 35 years. And so in one working career, one could see uh, the standard of living roughly double, and that was America's route, Americans route to whatever their version of the American dream. Uh, since then, all projections were that the economy would grow at roughly 2%, as the chair mentioned, and that with population growth, this meant that the income per person would double roughly every 70 years. So access to the American dream was twice as far away. In 2016, uh, the American economy didn't even do that well. Uh, the census data revealed that for those households that worked full-time for the full year, they saw zero increase in the real income. And so we entered 2017 with a severe growth problem, in my view. I think there have been some, some very beneficial changes on that front. Uh, during the uh, eight years of the Obama administration, the federal government finalized a costly regulation at a rate of roughly 1.1 per day every day, and the total self-reported cost by the agencies of complying with those regulations was $890 billion. So every year for eight years, over $100 billion in new regulatory costs were added to the, to the economy. And I think there's a little doubt that that's, that's harmed the growth potential. 
Since uh, the, uh, President Trump was inaugurated to the end of fiscal year 2017, the addition to that total is exactly $5 billion. And the commitment in the F President's budget is that in fiscal 2018, there will be a reduction of $9 billion in the overall regulatory costs. Now, there's no real science on exactly what the magnitude of the impact that will be on economic growth, but I think directionally that it has to be going in the right direction. I think it's uh, going to contribute to the capacity to start up small businesses and to have expansion of, of those uh, businesses in the U.S. economy. The second major event in 2015 was the passage of the Tax Cuts and Job Act, and the business provisions of the U.S. tax code prior to that law sent a very straightforward message to our most successful global companies. It, they said, if you've got some valuable intellectual property, park it abroad. Maybe park the production over there as well. Certainly, if you make any money, keep it over there. And if circumstances arise where you might be um, merging, uh, being merging with someone or acquiring a company, uh, move the headquarters as well. And so all the messages were to invest, innovate outside the United States. Uh, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act with reduction of the corporate rate 21%, the movement toward a ter more territorial system, the imposition of a patent box for uh, the return, global returns to intellectual property, uh, and the, the expensing provisions send a different message. It sends a message that says, invest, innovate, hire, and, and expand in the United States. And I think that's an incredibly valuable improvement in the, the business climate on something that will benefit productivity growth, capital per worker, and ultimately real wages in the United States. But, and, we, and we've seen, for example, the CBO credit um, that in their most report where they talk about the improved incentives to save, invest, uh, and, um, and uh, grow in the U.S., and more beneficial growth in 2018 and 19. The challenges that remain are, I think, really budgetary and the concerns I, I share with the chairman about our trade and, and our immigration uh, strategies at the moment. Um, the budgetary ones, as a former CBO director, troubled me the most. Uh, the, I think the, the CBO outlook should be a wake-up call to everybody. Uh, there's an enormous amount of red ink, not way out there, but right in front of us, and it needs to be dealt with. Um, it is not a pro-growth strategy to sail directly into a sovereign debt crisis, and the current, strategy, current trajectory is exactly that. It's not a matter of if, it's when does the U.S. get in trouble. And so we need to deal with the fact that these entitlement programs are growing at rates that are unsustainable. Medicare 7.3%, Social Security 6.3%, Affordable Care Act 6 Medicaid 5.2%. There isn't a tax code that's going to deliver that kind of revenue growth year over year uh, for the foreseeable future. So we need to reform those programs. We need to reform them for their beneficiaries as well. Those are not financially sustainable. It's a, 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 a tragic irony that our social insurance system is now delivering risk to its beneficiaries. And I, I would urge the Congress to fix that. So uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions, elaborate on my concerns with the, the other challenges that face us. But I believe progress has been made, uh, but the job is far from done. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Dr. Holzian. And Dr. Moutre, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Paulson, Vice Chairman Lee, Ranking Member Heinrich, and members of the Joint Economic Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the economic impacts of tax reform. Last fall, President Trump came to the NAM, the National Association of Manufacturers, the voice of 12.6 million men and women in America, uh, and he referred to tax reform as rocket fuel for the economy. Our members couldn't have agreed more. The NAM's latest quarterly outlook survey, released in December, showed a manufacturing sector with optim optimism levels at unprecedented heights, 94.6% of respondents saying that they felt positive about their own company's outlook, the highest in the survey's 20-year history. And while I can't get into specifics right now, we'll be releasing the next quarterly survey very shortly, ho hopefully very soon. Uh, much of this is due to the fact that the tax reform passed, uh, and even in anticipation of the tax reform actually getting enacted, manufacturers were energized as, as we haven't seen them in a long time. It's little wonder then, given that the tax reform achieved so many of the NEM's long thought goals, uh, that we're seeing such levels of optimism. Those goals are, as a, just a reminder, lowering the marginal tax rate so U.S. manufacturers can compete globally, reducing the burden on many small businesses and small and medium-sized manufacturing companies, which account for more than 90% of NAM members, moving us towards a territorial tax system much like the rest of the world, encouraging more dollars to flow back into the United States, and expanding fixed investment and incentivizing more private sector R&D. Of course, there are additional tax changes that could have supported the, that would continue to support the manufacturing sector even further. Uh, and of course, there are other factors underlying manufacturing optimism as well, such as uh, the global economy and, and smarter regulatory policies. I'll expand, obviously, much of this in my written testimony, but let's not bear the lead. Washington delivered with pro-growth tax reform, and it's already starting to make private sector businesses much more competitive. Private sector businesses are already starting to deliver as well. They're creating more well-paying jobs, they're putting more money in workers' pockets, they're investing more in their businesses and the economy. Nearly every day, we see more positive stories that underline these things anecdotally. Here are a few examples from NAM members. Thanks to tax reform, Miles Fireglass of Oregon recently raised its entry-level wage by 
gave all of its employees a pay bump and plans to nearly double the size of its workforce. It is also using tax reform savings to design a new facility that will cut back on waste and increase energy efficiency. Thanks to tax reform, Centennial Bolt in Denver will increase its workforce by nearly 50% and open a new plant in the Midwest. The company already gave a Christmas bonus to all of its hourly workers, totaling about 5% of their annual pay, and is currently planning another mid-year bonus as well as increases to their employees' profit-sharing program. Thanks to tax reform, Wyndham Millwork in Wyndham, Maine, is planning to increase its workforce by 20% and start a $1 million expansion of its facility. It also gave an immediate bonus of $1,000 to hourly workers and across the, pay, uh, across the board pay increases that the company des describes as a direct result of tax reform. The NEM, of course, continues to highlight this and many other stories on its, on its log site, uh, shopfloor.org, and will continue to do so in the coming weeks. The NEM is also in the process of surveying its membership on the impacts of tax reform, and we will release findings of those, that analysis in the coming days. But for now, let me share with you my predictions as an economist about what we might be able to expect in the manufacturing sector. I believe tax reform should lead to manufacturing investments rising by $55 billion in 2018, an increase of 11% compared to last year. Uh, I also believe that tax reform should lead to manufacturing employment rising by more than 100,000 this year, also a substantial increase, especially when you consider that the sector added 207,000 workers in 2017, and that was a banner year. Uh, we've already added 73,000 workers so far this year through the first two months. This is all based on a model that I've been working on to predict the, the impacts of tax reform. More broadly, I believe that the U.S. economy should expand this year at its fastest rate since 2005 at 3%. While manufacturers should, should benefit from stronger economic growth globally, it's clear that businesses are responding positively to the passage of pro-growth tax policies. The NAM will continue urging manufacturers to take further positive steps on jobs, benefits, and investments, just as we have continued urging the President and Congress to look for additional ways to enhance competitiveness and to lift up more Americans. That, I know, is also the goal of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moutry. Mr. Hampton, welcome, and you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Paulson, Ranking Member Heinrich, and members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify on unleashing America's economic potential through the perspective of one small Minnesota business. My name is Rick Hampton. I'm chairman of the board of Circuit Interruption Technology Incorporated. CIT was started in 1999 by my son after he graduated from the Metropolitan State University Business School. Jeff is with me today. Jeff is president and CEO of the company. My wife, Sharon, is chief financial officer. My daughter, Nicole, who is a businesswoman in her own right, handles international distribution and sales management. We now conduct business as CIT Relay and Switch, and in the past four years expanded from 12 to 22 employees. There are virtually no relay and switch manufacturers in the United States today. So we contract with manufacturing facilities in China and Korea. Many of our customers are household name, using our relays and switches in countless products. When, for example, you send your children off to school in a yellow bus, start your dishwasher, set your thermostat, <clears throat> drive a golf cart, even mix your favorite health drink at home, it's very likely we are using CIT product today. As earlier noted, Jeff launched the business in 1999 in our home. Using $50,000, he has saved from his college years landscaping business. I cash in my 401k. My wife and I borrowed $80,000 on credit cards and mortgaged our home. For two years, none of us received an income. Over the years, we shared equally the profits from our work with state and federal taxing authorities. Prior to the new December tax bill, the high average tax on CIT product led to a less than desirable business approach. To avoid double taxation, where the value of $1 might easily shrink to 35 cents, our CPA advised the best approach would be to take 100% of the profit out of the business, subject them to a one-time personal tax burden, roughly 50% state and federal. The resultant reinvested dollars, however, were seen by bankers as a liability, not retained earnings, thus impairing CIT credit standing. Tax reform has changed our business model. We immediately provided a bonus of one extra week's pay to all employees. This took place around Christmas. Provided raises to all of our employees. We funded our 401k program at a full 5% of their 2017 income with no employee match required. <laughs> We launched a $140,000 lab and facilities construction program, which is in process as we are here today. 
increased our employee base by 10%, with plans for another 10% by year's end. Due to the new law, after-tax profit of the 79% remaining will now be retained directly in the business. That is a whopping 79 cents on every dollar after tax. Jet fuel for a business like CIT. Tariffs, let me insert a word or two about what we apprehend as possible unintended consequences in a proposed tariff on relays in particular. An exclusive China tariff will provide a corresponding 25% competitive advantage to manufacturers located in Mexico and in Canada. And yes, even state-owned facilities in China who are often reimbursed for such expense, thus inadvertently punishing domestic companies like CIT. In conclusion, tax reform has been and will continue to be a tremendous help to our business and employees. We'll hire added staff this year, expand new products, and explore the cost of reshoring manufacturing. However, we are continue to be very apprehensive about regulations. I believe the lower tax will allow CIT relay and switch to position itself for even greater growth for the coming decade. More might be done, but this historic change has energized the entire CIT team, employees and management alike. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hampton. Mr. Mazur, you are recognized for five minutes. Great, thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, Chairman, Chairman Paulson, Ranking Member Heinrich, and the uh, members of the committee for inviting me here today. I think it's crucially important for the Congress to focus on the economic trajectory of, of the country. Um, I want to emphasize that while I'm Director of the uh, Nonpartisan Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, I'm here testifying on my own behalf. My view, uh, The views I, I, I discuss uh, are my own and shouldn't be attributed to the Tax Policy Center or Urban Institute or Brookings Institution. Given my background, I'm going to focus on the recently passed Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, the most significant tax uh, overhaul in the last 30 years. The, the new law does, does a lot of things. It does some major structural changes in the way that multinational firms are taxed, in the way that pass-through businesses are taxed. Um, it contains dozens of less uh, structural changes, removal of a number of tax expenditures, some income exclusions, um, cuts rates by, by a third for corporations and more modestly for, for individuals. And all these changes will have implications for, for the economy. But as a starting point for evaluation, I'd like to consider the four basic tenets of good tax policy. First, revenue adequacy, that our tax system should raise enough revenue to pay for the uh, goods and services that the public demands. Second, it should be an efficient tax system. There should be as little um, uh, in the way of negative effects on resource allocation, economic behavior, um, economic growth prospects. Third, a tax system should be equitable. There should be horizontal equity in that similarly situated taxpayers get treated about the same. And there should be vertical equity in that taxpayers with a greater ability to pay should contribute a higher portion of their, their income to the, to the, tax, uh, to, to the, to the country. Um, and last, a tax system should be simple. There should be a, a, sim a simplistic component. It should be designed so individuals and businesses know what the consequences of their behavior are and are able to take that into account um, ahead of time. And the tax uh, system should be clear uh, comprehensible and, and predictable. Now, in the real world, all these goals involve trade-offs, and, and um, it makes it uh, possible, though, to keep these goals in mind to, to at least evaluate what, what is going on with the tax system. There are some clear effects of the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. First, there are revenue effects. It's a big tax cut. Um, it's a big economic stimulus in the short term, approximately $130 billion in this fiscal year, double that in, in the next year. Second, distributional effects uh, are, are, are pretty clear. The tax benefits are tilted to higher income households. The bottom 20% of the income distribution gets on average about $60 a year, four tenths of a percent of the after tax income. The top 20% gets benefits in excess of $7,600 a year, a little over 2% of their after tax income. Um, third, the, there's a temporary nature of these tax cuts. The individual pro, uh, components generally are temporary. The in investment incentives generally temporary. The corporate tax cuts and the structure of the way multinational firms are taxed are, are permanent. The way multinational firms are taxed, quite different under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, brings the U.S. much more in line with our trading partners, moving us more toward a territorial system and away from a, from a worldwide system with, with deferral. There's been a lot of discussion about the economic effects of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. I think the conventional economic es estimates seem to indicate that there should be a burst of economic activity, economic growth in the short term. But those effects dissipate over time as uh, higher federal um, budget deficits increase interest rates and provide a crowd out for, for investment. Um, 
the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act will have a big impact on the fiscal position of the United States. If you look at the last 50 or 60 years of data, the U.S. Uh, has seen federal revenues fluctuate between 15 and 20 percent of GDP. And in that time period, there have been two small periods of time when the federal budget was balanced. The most recent one, late 1990s, early 2000s, revenues were around 20 percent of GDP. Given demographic trends, retiring baby boomers, longer lifespans, um, lower birth rates, um, we can expect that demands for, for federal goods and services will be 20 percent or more of, of GDP going forward. And so the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, by cutting revenues in the, in the short and medium term, moves in the opposite direction of, of uh, budget balance. And what this means is the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act really is a large fiscal experiment. The economy is near full employment, and we have a big fiscal stimulus at, at this point in time. Proponents of the act say that there will be improved investment incentives that will lead to greater accumulation of capital, more productive workers, and eventually higher wages for the workers. Um, it's too early to tell at this point whether all those linkages will be uh, be realized and what the strength of those linkages will be. Really, it'll be months or years before we can tell whether the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has had the, the intended effect. So the jury is out. Congress will have opportunities to revisit this act in the coming years as provisions expire or phase in or phase out. Um, and there'll be an opportunity to make any necessary changes. So thanks for your attention. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Mazur. And with that, we'll begin the question um, opportunity for all members. And just remind members to keep their questions to five minutes. Um, I will begin. Dr. Holtzikin, what are the most exciting parts of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in terms of boosting wages, uh, jobs, and investment in the United States? In, in the United States? And, and what are the risks to the economy if major parts of the law are allowed to expire going forward? So um, I would say the most important thing for the middle class would be to get real wages rising again. And the key pieces there, Dr. Mazur uh, outlined exactly right, which is to get better innovation and capital accumulation, higher and better capital per worker. Uh, that historically has been strongly linked with higher compensation for those workers. Uh, the, the, the key business tax reforms at the heart of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act are the things that I think are most beneficial. They are the movement to a territorial system, a corporate rate that is now in line with our, our adult competitors, the expending incentives, and the, the patent box so that we no longer tell all of our corporations to park their, their, their most profitable inventions uh, overseas. Uh, that, that, I think, is fantastic. Um, the pass-through provisions are intended to mirror those. Um, nothing's perfect. I, I have, everyone has their own quibbles with these things, but those are the core of the things that I think are most important. I, I'd just like to say, I think uh, everyone who looks at this should, should um, have a little humility when they talk about the projected impacts. The United States has never before and never again will move from a worldwide to a territorial system of taxation. It's the largest, most successful economy in the globe. It's doing something unprecedented. And the idea that we have fantastic precision about the ultimate impacts, I think, really overstates the case. I, I agree with the jury is out uh, sentiment. I'm, I'm looking at the data every, every month, and we'll just see how big those linkages are and how fast they happen. Dr. Moutry, uh, we've seen some very encouraging signs in manufacturing, as you outlined. Can you please tell us a little bit more about some of the most important steps that we can take to sustain the growing recovery of manufacturing here in America? Well, I think number one, we can continue to do what we've been doing, right? I think that the tax policy was a, a step in the right direction, but we need to continue to improve the tax policy, making some of those provisions permanent. Uh, on, the, on the regulatory side, I think we also have continued uh, a policy of, of, of enacting smart, very business-friendly policies, making sure we're looking not just at the overall impacts, but looking at the impact on small businesses in particular. Uh, and from, from, from manufacturers, I think we just need to continue to make sure that uh, the economy continues to grow and, and flourish, and we're certainly seeing that in manufacturing, not just with the, the, the example I gave earlier, but, you know, the number one issue right now amongst manufacturers is the ability to attract and retain workers. Uh, and this, I think, speaks to just how strong the economy is, how strong the manufacturing sector is, and hopefully that leads to, to wage appreciation moving forward. Would you say one of those components to attracting and retaining workers is what Dr. Holtzika had mentioned in his written testimony, mostly about some immigration components and the importance of having a workforce that's entering those markets for manufacturing? I would definitely agree with that, and okay. we've certainly supported that. Good. Uh, Mr. Hampton, uh, again, welcome. And let me ask you this. In spite of how it provided massive tax relief to middle-class Americans, we sometimes hear people characterize the Tax Cut and Jobs Act as only mostly benefiting and as a giveaway to the wealthy. But how would you respond to that? I mean, you know, from your perspective and your personal story. Um, it's actually uh, somewhat Maybe just hit, hit your microphone there. And, it's actually somewhat the reverse of that. Uh, before, we were forced in, to avoid double taxation. We were actually having to take money out of the business. Uh, as a result of the law, we're able to leave it in. We can leave in nearly 80 percent uh, of the profit dollars because we're taxed at 21 percent. Before, to avoid the potential for double taxation, 
we removed 100% of the money from the business, took a personal tax on that money, and then reinvested the 50% back into the business. So actually, it's going to improve our situation, and that's why I say this year we, we will begin uh, every year leaving the money in the business into retained earnings. That allows us to make investments in additional personnel and so forth, particularly in the engineering and technical side for the exploration and possibly reshoring manufacturing, which this country desperately needs, particularly in the product that we supply, as we supply product even for aircraft carriers, and it's made in China. It makes no sense. We need to build it here. So it sounds like with some of the retained earning provision or, you know, success of, of, of the new law you talked about, do you see the track record continuing on, on the same parallel of, you know, you gave some special bonuses, you gave pay raises, uh, you contributed to the 401k. Do you see that same path forward if, if, uh, if there's no interruptions to sort of current tax our, policy? Our, our current plan with the uh, tax policy is that we indeed will be uh, funding again this year full 5% for employees. And by the way, that is 100% their money. We don't say that you're going to serve so many years. As soon as we give it, they own it. Hmm. And that means 100% of what we have in 401k, those people own. We do not own it. And we will con continue with that. We also plan to do another bonus for weeks bonus this year. Uh, we are adding additional employees. Uh, so I, I think most of these programs will definitely continue forward. Thank you. Ranking Member Heinrich, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Holt, second, you said that we need to reform entitlements. And one of the interesting things I find is that I've never had a constituent come up to me uh, at a meeting and ask me about their entitlements or talk to me about their entitlements. They usually talk to me about Social Security and Medicare. And it makes me wonder if the difference isn't that it polls a lot better to say reform entitlements than it, than it polls to say you should cut my Social Security. So I want to ask you about that reform. Uh, when we talk about reforming Social Security, um, in your view, should that include reducing benefits for some workers in their retirement years? My major concern with Social Security is that the trust fund exhausts under current projections roughly 13 years, and uh, people in retirement will have the benefits cut by 25% across the board. And I think that's a disgraceful way to run a pension program. You're assuming and so, those cuts are going to happen, but you're saying we should we under should current law that would happen. We should cut benefits now. No, in under order, current, I didn't say that. In order to not get to the point where no, those I didn't say any of that. Right? I said so. How that program would, needs how to be would addressed. How you suggest we reform that program? Should we Personally? look at reducing the or increasing the retirement age? Uh, yeah, I think that's sensible. That won't get very much. It, it, that makes a small contribution to the fiscal sustainability of the program. There's going to be a so combination we're back, of we're back to benefits. I think there's there's no way that we can deal with Social Security, which is is growing at 6.2% per year, and revenues, which are going to grow at something that is roughly the rate of the economy. What if we increase the cap? It's a one-time increase. Yeah. You have a, a, a sustained long-term problem of rapid growth so, that in benefits that's faster than revenue. I just I find it ironic that you know we look back in 2001 and 2003 uh, when you oversaw the the, the CBO. The Bush administration added $1.5 trillion to the deficit. Now my Republican colleagues have added another $1.9 trillion to the deficit, and we always look to people on Social Security and Medicare to pay for this. I don't find that to be a credible solution. Dr. Mischer, I want to ask you, and I'm not going to go through, again, the, the, frail, the, the faults of the, the national debt being added through this tax code, but this week we've seen the House preparing now to vote on so-called balanced budget amendment. What impact would a balanced budget amendment have specifically on Social Security, on Medicare, and on Medicaid? Well, it's hard to say without seeing the, the details of how the, the amendment would be um, implemented. Um, but it seems to me like a, a balanced budget amendment, it's kind of an abdication of responsibility from members of Congress who really, it's their job to be fiscally responsible. You shouldn't need a constitutional amendment to tell you to do your job. People at home are shocked by what you have to say there. Sorry. Yeah. If you look at that, specifically from how you are able to address an economy when you fall into a recession? How would it affect the federal government's ability to respond to a recession and get an economy moving again? It would very much hamstring it. I think if you look at what happens at state level where you have a balanced budget amendment is revenues go down during an economic downturn and you respond typically by cutting expenditures. In the federal government, we have automatic stabilizers, increased unemployment benefits and the like, that allow you to kind of cushion the, the downturn. And I think we saw in the Great Recession the value of having those automatic stabilizers really did put a floor under, under the economy. You mentioned in your testimony that higher deficits can cause interest rates to increase, and certainly with 
if we see um, a $2 trillion increase in the deficit, that's not in, inconsequential. Uh, we saw higher rates in the CBO's pro uh, projections released on Monday. Um, how will higher interest rates affect the costs that consumers bear through things like car loans and, uh, in particular, home mortgages? So uh, higher interest rates affect uh, people in several ways. There are a number of, of interest rates that are tied to market rates. Your car loan rates are, are typically tied to your, your market rates. Your mortgage rates typically tied to a 30-year bond rate. Uh, credit card rates tied to a uh, short-term interest rate. All those things would bump up if you see interest rates across the board going up. Uh, Mr. Chair, I've only got a few seconds left, so I'm going to yield them back. Thank you. I now recognize Vice Chair and Lee for five minutes. Thank you very much. I appreciate each of you being willing to come and talk to us about these issues today. Um, we measure a lot of things in this town, and you know, appropriately so. We talk a lot about GDP, about GDP growth, uh, and what government might be doing to affect it. I think it's difficult to talk about our economic situation and our true economic potential, however, um, without addressing a number of other issues, things that are more difficult sometimes to quantify, things that are a little bit less obvious, um, things that account for the uh, social and cultural state of American life. And, and I tend to think that these other less well-measured, or at least less frequently measured and discussed topics are, are um, as important for economic growth and for the health of our economy and our country as, as anything else. So I've got a question for all of you. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Mr. Holtzik and, and, and move our way across the table. In measuring our country's long-term viability, how important is the flourishing of America's associational life uh, or the social capital? Uh, that, that is the strength of families, the strength of communities, community cohesion, trust, and, and collective e efficacy. Uh, what can you tell me about that? I think it's incredibly important. Uh, we know from the data that there's a best practice in America, which is that a young person should go to school, graduate, get a job, get married, and then have children. And if one does it in any other order, it's a ticket one way to poverty. And so those things are, are, are at the foundation of economic success in the United States. We know also from the data, uh, many studies done by a group led by a Harvard University professor, that mobility in the United States, broadly measured, hasn't changed much in the past 50 years, social mobility, economic mobility. You might think it's not high enough, or you might think it's fine, but it hasn't changed much. But the geography of it has. And there are places in the United States where mobility has diminished and diminished sharply. There are places associated with less of those kinds of capital. So I think it's something that's, that's very important, although, as you say, very hard to measure. So last night I was at the STEP Awards, the Science, Technology, Engineering, and Production Awards that honors 130 women in manufacturing. Uh, and you get really a first-hand view of just how important manufacturing is to the lives of these ladies and to their families, how proud they are of their accomplishments, and just how different it is. I took my 13-year-old my daughter to be able to see just how, how you can be successful, how, again, manufacturing is that pathway to the middle class. Uh, and I think that we need to have more of that emphasis of stressing what, that women can be successful, manufacturing can be that engine for growth, not just for the economy, but for your family and for your community. Uh, and, and I think that we have certainly have done that. And I think certainly, timing-wise, it was good that I was just there last night. Wonderful. Thank you. Put your hand. For me, I can just boil it down to uh, personal type stories. A young lady came to us from uh, Chicago who had uh, three children, and she had no job and a husband in prison and she had little, if any, education. We started her out in the assembly area of the company, and she had such a wonderful personality that we brought her into the front office, and my daughter, Nicole, took her under her wing and started training her how to use email and like, and now she does all of our order processing and so forth, and uh, makes in the area of 45000 uh, per year. And uh, her family is uh, now much more successful. Her husband's gotten out of prison, and, and the two of them have been reunited. And uh, the program is working very, very good. But it's uh, social. When you talk about social engineering, I think there's a lot manufacturing and companies can do uh, by looking at people in a whole different way. And that is what they can contribute as opposed to what they cannot contribute. And we look at it in terms of what capabilities a person has, not what they don't have. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree. I think the um, civic associations and the informal connections are, are important. It provides for networks. It's a lot of social capital. provides informal mentorships. Um, in addition, um, businesses um, 
um, also have invested in their communities, and it seems to me, at least today, less so than at times in the, in the past. And, and that's an area where you can see um, connections in older um, industrial communities where there's not that civic engagement, not that civil, civic capital. Thank you. Thanks to each of you. I'm, I'm, I'm out of time, so I'll, I'll forego my other questions. did want to let you know I released a report today titled The Geography of Social Capital in America, and it pre presents a, a breakdown of um, social capital statistics broken down at state and county level. I highly recommend it to each of you and to my fellow members of the committee. Look at that. Senator Peters, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Mr. Chairman, and each of our panelists appreciate uh, your testimony uh, here today uh, as well. Um, uh, Dr. Major, I took uh, interested when you talked about the jury is out on this uh, on this uh, tax bill. Uh, we've got to see this experiment. I think uh, Dr. Holtzig, you mentioned that as well. This is a pretty grand experiment. We don't know what the results are. But what I think, and, and tell me your thoughts on this, when I think of fiscal policy and how a government should responsibly uh, deal with uh, its spending, is that typically when an economy is strong and when an economy is at full employment or nearly full employment, which we were at, normally that's the time you should start paying down debt because things can turn the other way. And as we saw with the Great Recession, it was essential to be able to prime the pump, so to speak, to get the economy going, which uh, was very successful. We've had robust growth and job creation since what was close to a, a Great Depression mm -hmm. uh, with, that we were faced with. And Martin and I and others, Eric, I think we all came into Congress about uh, that time. So the, just your thoughts. Is this an appropriate time to be going into deep deficit spending uh, when the economy is recovering? I guess I get the kind of sense that we're kind of on a sugar high right now, and sugar highs are a whole lot of fun, but unfortunately they don't last that long. But tell me. Yeah, um, yeah I think um, President Kennedy once talked about the time to repair the roofs when the, when the sun's shining, right? That's like the good times are when you should be taking those steps in order to shore things up. Um, and so that is one of the aspects that makes this a big fiscal experiment that this is a, a, a set of policies that's different than what the United States has typically undertaken. Typically, we've done stimulus um, activities during times of, of economic downturns. Here, we're doing a, a very stimulative fiscal bill and during a generally pretty good economic times. Dr. Holtzirkin, do you agree with that? Um, in part, um, I think it's important to remember that um, the baseline budget outlook when uh, President Trump took office had $10 trillion of deficits uh, in it over the next 10 years. So we were going to do deficit spending regardless. Uh, the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act added to the deficit. No so we, about we that. expanded it, though. So is that a good idea, just to put, put the pedal to the metal and keep going? Uh, the core things that I talked about in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act aren't, aren't stimulus. They are permanent structural changes to the tax code to permanently alter the incentives for our businesses in terms of both the location and the scale of their innovation investment. I think that was crucial. Well, we, we, say not we, we were losing them. companies at a remarkable rate. We had run the experiment about whether the, the existing tax code was, was working, and it wasn't. So it had to change. But had I had my druthers, pardon, I didn't interrupt, but I, it would have been revenue neutral. But no one gets everything they want in tax form, and well, I, think I didn't either. And I think that's the important thing about revenue neutral is that you say these are long-term structural changes, but they're putting us on a long-term structural deficit is what We were happening. already on one is what I would emphasize. I, I would. I wouldn't disagree, but now we've increased it. So if you didn't like the other deficit, you certainly can't like a bigger deficit. Is that true? Or I don't, don't like, like any of them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like any of them. You're right, exactly. So, so that is what the, the course that we're on is now increasing that, which is a pretty dangerous course. You know, that we do need to have some responsibility here. Uh, and I know the short-term impact is good as the sugar high that we're on right now, but even that, the jury is out on that. We're not sure exactly what's going to happen uh, with that. Uh, you've talked about uh, the uh, changes uh, in the entitlements, and I appreciated your response to uh, Senator Heinrich. But, you know, specifically, because you mentioned Social Security, what would you do for Social Security? Personally? Yes. Uh, I think a combination of raise the minimum benefit, raise the benefit for the most elderly, because that's a place of risk right now, uh, change the indexing in retirement to, to match the chain CPI, change the initial awards of Social Security benefits so they're less generous for lifetime affluent people, people like me, and uh, index the cap to be 90% of the wage base. That's roughly what every bipartisan commission has suggested. I would take the last five commissions, toss them in a hat, pull one out, and do it. What, what I would emphasize is doing something. To have that program right now, creating cash flow deficits, and promising to disrupt retirement lives in 13 years is, is I think, disgraceful. And it is at the core of our social safety net, and it's not the only one. There are many others as well, so if you go down the list, each of our social insurance programs, the ones that are supposed to make people's lives safer, are making their lives more dangerous. But I, I may ask a response to the Social Security. One part of what happened, uh, and I think of the last major change to Social Security reform is back when President Reagan was here. Mm -hmm. 
And there were fixes uh, to the system that everybody said this would last forever. As far as you could see, we're going to put Social Security on a sustainable course. And if I recall, you know, and, and you correct me on some of these numbers, roughly about 90. I don't 90 think that's quite right, you know, but that that was as far as I could see at that time, and maybe <laughs> Ronald Reagan's was far it wasn't <laughs> some of others, but but it was for a long time. Yep. But we had what we were doing is basically it was being funded by roughly I think it was in the 90 percent range of the amount of of revenue coming into the economy as whole. But what we have seen since that time is growing income inequality in this country in a dramatic way. Now that has shrunk considerably because we have more and more of the income at the very high levels, their contribution to Social Security is capped, and middle-income folks have actually seen stagnant wages over those years. So this is a longer-term structural problem, really, I think, linked to growing income inequality. I know we don't have time for that answer, but we'd love to have the discussion. Representative Handel, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for uh, being here. Staying along the lines of our uh, social safety net, um, it's very, very clear that as a country, we are extraordinarily compassionate and generous in that arena. Um, and we're helping millions of struggling Americans. However, as each of you, several of you have referenced, we really are um, struggling in terms of the structure of some of these programs, in terms of the spending, but also, although well-intended, they seem to have in some cases created inadvertently a disincentive to return to the workplace. And then that exacerbates the workforce issues that we have. What suggestions, and I'll start with Dr. Holtz Eakin, would you have around how can we move more people from being um, on these social safety net programs and out of the workplace back into the workplace so that we give back that dignity of work and improve the standard of living? Uh, it's, it's an enormously complicated question, mm -hmm. but you know, the, I, I think it's important to just take a look at the entire social safety net and try to make it more pro-work. And to recognize that uh, in many cases, the, the phase out of benefits, which is intended to be fiscally responsible things, provides work disincentives for many low-income individuals. So that those have been some well-documented problems so there. dealing with that so-called yeah. cliff at the top. Yeah, I, you know, there, there's some program to program structural issues, but I think the, the, the notion that um, we should expect people who can't work to work is, is a simple and straightforward one that ought to be embedded all through what we do. And what are your thoughts that. on um, some minimum work requirements for some of these programs? For those who are able-bodied uh, able -bodied and um, capable, I, I think that's an entirely sensible thing. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Moultrie, I wanted to uh, talk about um, a little bit on the regulatory front. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing in terms of specific regulatory hurdles and impacts within the manufacturing sector? I hear a lot from companies in my district, just about one company, 100 employees, eight of whom are specifically 100% dedicated to regulatory compliance. What more can we do um, as Congress and across the regulatory agencies to start to draw that down? So thank you. Uh, we listened early on at the beginning of Trump administration. We asked all of our member companies, all of our manufacturers to submit their ideas for, again, we're in a different environment when it comes to the regulatory space, mm -hmm. keeping in mind that we all recognize we want clean air, clean, clean water, et cetera. But what, could, what would you improve if we were to get rid of old regulations? What would you streamline? What, what are the real burdens that are out there? We prepared uh, uh, some actual written examples of that, gave it to the Commerce Department at the beginning of last year. So we'd start there as, as examples of places May where I we ask, could. could I, I'll give you a card afterwards. I would sure. love to have a copy of that. I'm a new kid on the block here, so we'll, we'll definitely I would get that to see you. that. We'll definitely get that to you. But I think the, the, the bottom line is we recognize that cumulative burdens continue to get larger and larger. Last year was a unique year, and that there was essentially a moratorium on regulations, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we also want to make sure that, that, as I said earlier, businesses, manufacturers, especially small manufacturers, voices are heard, being heard. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Representative Delaney, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to start by just uh, congratulating Mr. Hampton on the success and growth of your business, and I'd also add you are a very effective witness here, so I don't know if you did this in your prior life, but uh, you were very good at this. But uh, <laughs> seriously, congratulations on the business. Uh, Dr. Holseekin, uh, just a couple of questions for you. One of the things that I've been frustrated with is the debate around the deficit, where some people say deficits don't matter, and other people say that we shouldn't spend more than we take in. And it's always seemed to me that if we could target deficits at, say, minus 2 percent, which is something that is potentially doable, even though that's incredibly hard to do, that that would be a more realistic goal, and that actually would be the kind of sensible goal we should have in terms of the long-term fiscal health of the country, because the economy can grow more than 2 percent a year, 
our debt as percentage of our economy will stabilize, which is really the, the, the only metric that matters uh, as it relates to, to these things. So I'm interested in your views on that. Well, I think I roughly concur. I, I'm a little more aggressive. I'd like to have the debt as a share of the economy go down a negative downward trajectory. It doesn't have to be sharp, but, but put us in a position where we're sending the message to, to world capital markets that uh, we've got our fiscal house in order, that we're not going to end up in a position where we're going to have sharp disruption of the government, rapid hikes in uh, either interest rates or taxes to, to deal with things. And, and that's that's what you need to do, is to, is to send that clear message to capital markets and the economic threat of the fiscal outlook would diminish rapidly. So how do you feel about balanced budget uh, acts? Uh, balanced budget amendments uh, to the Constitution are of the class of things called fiscal rules. And around the globe, there have been countries that have resorted to fiscal rules when their elected uh, representatives are unable to, to, to get the, the job done. So they are a recognition of failure. Uh, they tend to work. But do you think zero deficits is the right target? Because that's uh, really what it does. Zero deficits, it, realistically? Like if uh, you could set economic no, policy, would you set minus one and a half, which it sounds like you're saying, or would you set zero? I wouldn't set for zero, but I, I've now been in this town and watched this operation for quite some time. No one's threatened me with zero or even close. And but that's so, what those... And, and that's law would do, why right? people are looking to things like the balanced budget amendment. I think they are basically an admission that we're on track for the next 10 years. Right, I, I get the 4.9%. Yeah. So do you think zero across time would be bad economic policy, like zero no. every year? No. I, really? I, I think most, if, if you look at those balanced budget amendments, the, the ones that have been considered recently, they have uh, correct out clauses for major recession or uh, circumstances where it would be sensible to run deficits. So do you think the tax bill, uh, recognizing the fix in the international system was something that desperately had to be had done? To happen. So I, we're in agreement on that. But do you think the tax bill would have been a better tax bill if and rather than cutting the corporate rate to 21, we would have cut it to 25 or 26 or 27 and use the additional revenues for something like infrastructure or to make the bill uh, more deficit uh, appropriate? So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dodge the question at the outset, and then I'll answer it. But I, I will say this. As a, dodge quickly so we get to the answer. Okay. Um, as a general matter, you never get to choose between the tax reform and the tax reform with the provision you'd like. That, none of the I get, get all that. that. Yeah. I'm so, just asking you if you actually could do this. If I, I think getting it to 20 was the right target. You do. we, we got to be internationally competitive. Other countries are going to move. It's not like they're going to How do you think a carbon tax could fit in across time? A carbon tax is a consumption tax. I'm a big fan of consumption taxes um, as part of a thoughtful strategy for tax policy, you could certainly uh, think about that. As an add-on, for the sake of doing it, I'm not a big fan. What do you mean? In, in, explain your answer there more. So, How, wh On what context would you do it? So, for example, the, the House um, uh, uh, Task Force came up with a, what was really a, a destination-based cash flow tax. It was a consumption-style tax. Right. So, so it was what moving the you wouldn't do carbon do tax on its own. So you could do that in, in the context of something like that. But you don't think carbon tax on its own? No. Not just not just as a, a just a pure revenue uh, approach. I think if we're going to to do something as major as that, fix the code you have. Got it. Okay, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Representative LaHood. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all the witnesses here today for your valuable testimony. Um, I want to start off with uh, Dr. Mutre, um, and you mentioned in your testimony. Uh, how effective the tax reform bill has been and regulatory relief on the manufacturing sector of our country. We've created well over 200,000 new jobs in manufacturing, which people I don't think thought was possible, and it's positive um, for a healthy and robust economy. Um, I want to get your thoughts just in the last month here, last few weeks, on potential trade war as it relates to uh, steel and aluminum tariffs and how that uh, collaterally will affect manufacturing jobs. I, look, I just looked at a statistic here that, uh, according to the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia, the futures for capital expenditures over the last uh, two months is down, uh, dropped 11 percent. And I wonder if you can describe the level of fear uh, that a trade war, uh, what that could do to manufacturing. I think, first off, just to say that, we, that certainly the President is trying to address some, some real unfairnesses that are out there in terms of what China's been doing in terms of intellectual property and in terms of overall trade. And so I think that there's that recognition, just kind of putting that out there. Manufacturers in general don't like tariffs. We, the NAM itself was founded as a free trade organization in 1895, and, and there's an awful lot of anxiety out there about what could happen on the tariff side. We actually have been calling, as you know, uh, for, for hopefully what, what all of these tariffs, all of this trade talk uh, really leads to is some more extended conversations with China. Uh, earlier this week, last week, our president and CEO asked for 
bilateral trade agreement with China. Hopefully this leads to that. Uh, in the meantime, you're right. Certainly our, our members are very upbeat, uh, but the, the trade talk and the tariff talk is certainly an uncertainty that, that is, is not helpful. And if we do have a full um, trade war, do you have concerns this wipe, wipes away some of the gains that we've made in tax reform and regulatory relief? I think it certainly affects the overall op level, level of optimism, yes. Thank you. And Dr. Holtz, can, can you come in on uh, the level uh, of fear that you have with trade war and the potential road we're headed down? I, I, I'm very concerned. Uh, I was in the White House when President Bush uh, imposed steel tariffs. Uh, those tariffs uh, harm steel consuming consumers more than they help steel producers. They bought us nothing on the international front, and they're ultimately disallowed by the WTO. It's all costs, no benefit. I think these are the same, and I wouldn't have done them. Uh, I would echo what um, Mr. Mutre said about identifying China, but I, I'm unclear on what the strategy is. What is it that we're asking China to do? At what pace? When will we know we've had a success? Um, and to get into this kind of uh, tariff war without a strategy and an end game strikes me as dangerous. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the um, the reasoning for the tariffs as it relates to national security and whether that holds up with uh, WTO? I, I see little chance the WTO will, will uphold those tariffs. The, the Defense Department itself issued a memo that said these steel is not a national security issue. We have enough uh, domestically. Aluminum, we can do it, get it from reliable partners. So, I, I, you know, when the country that imposed the tariffs says we really didn't need them, that's, that's not going to help the case. And in terms of suggestions on how we ought to go about this differently in a precision way uh, in going after the Chinese, what's your recommendation on that? I, I think the lesson of history is it's very difficult to win a bilateral showdown with, with the Chinese. And um, uh, they have the, the negotiating advantage, and that's the only thing it is, of not having a democracy, and President Xi can just wait us out. So I think that strategy is not going to be very successful. I would have preferred a more a multilateral strategy. I, you know, get a coalition of countries, agree on uh, pressure China, and, and move it that way. Gotcha. Uh, switching subjects, we talked a little bit about debt and, um, you know, what that does to our economy. Obviously, uh, no matter how fast the economy uh, grows, if spending continues to outpace growth, our economy is only going to get worse. And you've referenced that a little bit, uh, Dr. holtz -Eakin. Um, in terms of reforms uh, to make to our budget process, appropriations project process, and spending processes to, to reverse this, um, what suggestions do you have for us? Well, the, the good news on that front, there is a joint select committee that's going to take this issue up, and I, and I applaud Congress for that. I think there are, there are two problems, and, and one is the near-term problem in the appropriations process, which has led to lots of uh, threats of government shutdown and, and threats on the raising the debt limit, both of which I, I view as dangerous. Then the longer-term problem is mandatory spending. This country balanced its budget on the whole for centuries, and then we invented mandatory spending, and we haven't balanced it since. So dealing with how you do oversight and assessment of mandatory spending so that it doesn't get out of line with the resources is the key issue. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Maloney. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, and I uh, thank all of the uh, panelists for your, your testimony. And Mr. Hampton, I was very impressed with your, your business and your testimony. One of the challenges, though, is most of, of the business owners that I'm reading about, they're, they're not plowing it back into wages. It's usually a one-time bonus. Maybe they'll make it permanent later, but a lot of bonuses, not permanent wages that I've been reading, and many are using this uh, tax uh, uh, bonus as a paying out to shareholders as opposed to plowing it back and growing the business like you are. But I hope more people uh, make the same decisions that you've made. But I I'd like to ask... Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Holtzigan, about uh, an op-ed that uh, appeared recently in, in the uh, Washington Post, and I'd like permission to place the op-ed in, in, in the record. Without objection. And it, it was written by four very prominent uh, former chairs of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, uh, Jason Furman, Alan Kruger, Laura Tyson, Martin Neil Bailey, and Janet Yellen. And, and the economist argued that in the future, the United States will face a large debt crisis, as we've all been talking about, but they argue that uh, entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, are not to blame. And they make three points that I find interesting and I'd like to hear your response to. Number one, they, they write uh, that the large tax cuts and unfunded wars have been huge contributors to our current deficit problem. And the primary reason the de deficit in coming years will now be higher than it had been expected is the reduction in tax revenue from last year's tax cuts not an increase in spending. Uh, do you agree with their 
uh, assessment, would you begin with the yes or no and give your explanation to their first point? I, I do not agree with them. Uh, again, I would go back to... But it's $1.7 billion, billion I, by all accounts. I would go back to the, the baseline budget outlook in January 2017, prior to any tax legislation, which showed that there would be an additional $10 trillion in deficits over the next 10 years, and that did not come from discretionary accounts. It came from the mandatory accounts, so it wasn't wars, and it came because all the mandatory spending grow at rates faster than the economy, faster than any plausible revenue gain. That those those are the entitlement programs. So arithmetically, I think they're simply incorrect. Okay. Secondly, the five economists further write that the tax cuts passed last year added an amount to America's long-term fiscal challenge that is roughly the same size as the pre-existing shortfalls in Social Security and Medicare. Uh, do you agree, yes or no, with that in your explanation? Um, I disagree, but I think it's a misleading statement by them, quite frankly. They compared it to Medicare Part A, which is a subset of the entire Medicare program. The entire Medicare program is three-quarter financed out of general revenue. Parts uh, B and D uh, were structured that way, and they run enormous cash flow deficits, over $300 billion a year. And to throw them out of that calculation and compare it only to Part A is to really mischaracterize the situation. Thirdly, the, and this, uh, Mr. Peters, uh, Senator Peters brought this up too, and others on the panel. The economists write that decreasing our debt to GDP ratio will require running smaller deficits in strong economic periods, such as the present, to offset the large deficits are needed in recessions to restore demand and avoid deeper crisis. Do you agree, yes or no? Uh, th that's a, a, a beautiful theory in textbook. Uh, no government, Republican, Democrat, in my lifetime has done it. Okay. And, and, and lastly, uh, or is my time up? It's. Uh, uh, four years ago, the, the consensus estimate at the Fed of the NARU, the non-accelerating rate of unemployment, was 5.4 percent. And what likely would have happened if the rate dropped further, as it has? And in response, the Fed has raised interest rates, uh, which they're saying they're going to do. So, to well, more of I, an extent. I, I think it's a good news story if the Fed is worried about the economy growing too fast. That's been the least of our concerns for a long time. It's held rates at what they admitted were uh, unusually low and uh, were labeled extraordinary monetary policy, except that they became very ordinary as we got used to them. So I think it's a good news thing that they are normalizing the stance monetary policy. I think it's been surprising the degree to which the unemployment rate has been able to fall. And we've seen labor force participation rise uh, more than I think a lot of people expected. Uh, we see no particular evidence of current inflation as a result of this. And we do see some acceleration in, in average hourly earnings. That's all a good news story. And, and I hope that it continues. Okay, my time has expired. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Bayer. Recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, Dr. Major, the, the, tomorrow we have uh, the House taking doom to fail messaging vote on the balanced budget amendment, um, probably to provide cover for members of, for feeling buyers more so the, after their deficit increasing votes when faced with the new CBO deficit figures. Um, but now as we, it seems like we've built a house of cards, we have more than a trillion dollar deficits for the foreseeable future. How do we possibly consider long-term sustainable growth? How are we unlocking America's economic prospects when our debt levels will quickly equal GDP, ever-increasing pressure on interest rates? What's the smart way to address the debt and deficit we have? So, so I think uh, the, the point that um, Douglas Holtz and, and I both made is that in um, good times, you should be running smaller deficits and can be on a downward trajectory so that it becomes uh, the, the debt becomes a smaller fraction of your, your economy over, over time. And I think you saw that in the, the late 1990s, where the budget was actually in balance um, for late 1990s, early 2000s. And then we embarked on a series of tax cuts and unpaid for war Medicare benefits expansion. Uh, and, and we moved into a situation where we had larger deficits. Um, so kind of to I guess, harken back to what I mentioned earlier about uh, President Kennedy, that the time to really work on repairing your fiscal um, situation is when things are going good during the good economic times. And it seems to me we're having a missed opportunity. We have an opportunity to do it now during relatively good times and we're not taking advantage of that. I'd like to compliment Mr. Hampton on sharing so much of the benefits to his business of the tax cuts with your employees. Uh, but as many predicted, we've seen that as opposed to fueling wage increases or even investment in the recipient businesses, the lion's share of the corporate tax cuts seems some things to say greater than 80% is going to stock buybacks and dividends. Um, Dr. Major, do you see limiting the use of buybacks, which we used to do until regulatory changes in the early 1980s, as a worthwhile public policy response that would promote a natural 
focus on wages, investment, and research and development rather than all that going to the people who are own the assets that we have? Uh, I, I view a stock buyback as more of a, of a financial transaction which keeps the value of the company the same. It's just dollars of cash goes, uh, goes out and shares get retired. So the company stays about the same, the same size. Now, there may be um, concern about earnings per share being um, driven up because there are fewer shares out there. Um, but that's really the responsibility of the board of directors of the, the company to, to look at that. Not, uh, I don't think it's really a federal government responsibility. This is part of the issue. If you look at Dr. Holtz, you can, again, Dr. Major, or early on he points out that the growing gap between the productivity rate of increase and the wage rate of increase, that, uh, and we've had year after year of record corporate profits, that businesses haven't been sharing the increases in productivity gains with the people? There, there, there may be some, some truth to that. I think that, you know, we have had a stagnant minimum wage over the last uh, number of years. We've not increased the minimum wage. We've had a reduction in um, unionization over decades now. Both of those would have been ways to get more dollars into the, the pockets of the, the, the workers. Um, and we've not done either of those things. Uh, finally, Dr. Major, we've seen that the, the past due provision uh, seems to meet, failed to meet all four of the standards of good tax policy that you laid out in your testimony. We're already seeing the Wall Street Journal that uh, this section of the bill is sort of the most tortured gaming that has occurred since the passage of the new tax law. Uh, a tax law professor, Dan Shavira, called it, quote, the worst provision ever even to be seriously proposed in the history of the federal income tax. Is there any way to fix this? That's a, that's a hard question. I think that um, you are setting up a situation where it's relatively easy through paper transactions to change form of income from one uh, um, level of tax to a different to a lower level of tax. And you should expect to see gaming on that, uh, on that, uh, on that front. Um, one of my, one of my um, law friends also quipped, similar to, to Dan Shavira, that the uh, jobs part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was a tax planner's jobs, that there will be many tax planner's jobs as a result of this. And that's an example in the flow-through area where you could see that be the case. Very good. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you. And uh, I was going to say we're going to start with the Minnesotan and end with the Minnesotan. Ms. Senator Cruz just got here, but we'll go with Senator Klobuchar. You're recognized oh. for five minutes. All right. Oh, very good. I had my moment a few years ago speaking of unleashing the economy where Minnesota beat out Texas. It's the best state to do business in in this CNBC survey. And I completely enjoy telling Senator Cruz about it. But I do um, welcome uh, Mr. Hampton. And um, he's a real success story right out of Rogers, Minnesota, uh, which is on the western part of the metropolitan area. And I grew up not that far from there, um, employing 22 Minnesotans and Americans. Thank you for that. Um, and I note that your business is, um, Senator Heinrich and I were thinking you, that you are in the business of circuit interruption technology and that we need a little circuit interruption around Washington right now. So maybe you can bring us some. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I thought I'd start with you, uh, Dr. Holtz-Egan, and talk about, I was just uh, around our state in a lot of of the um, rural areas um, last week. And there's just a huge problem with workforce shortages everywhere I heard it. From medium-sized companies, manufacturing to peat mines to um, the uh, just regular farming. And um, we've done a lot of work with apprenticeships and I think we should be doing more nationally. Senator Collins and I have a bill on this and uh, maybe loosening up some of the rules about how old kids are when they can uh, start doing apprenticeships while they're in school because uh, it's a patchwork of state and federal laws, and I'm going to talk to the Labor Secretary about that, uh, doing more on STEM, obviously, and just some very cool things going on with our high schools around Minnesota, um, where kids in ninth grade are getting exposed to a class with tech or uh, the traditional shop, which it no longer is, robotics, um, and then having kids choose a traditional track or healthcare or manufacturing. And those are all good things, but what and are incredibly important, I still don't think it's going to fill the short-term need that I'm seeing in our state. So I just wondered if you comment about immigration reform. Um, and right now we're going backwards. I had a turkey producer who the new rule is he can't get them his uh, part-time uh, seasonal workers. He can't get them from the same country anymore. He has to rotate countries and he had the same crew coming in for 17 years. Um, and we just are seeing with the dreamers not getting on a path to citizenship, Liberians in our state, um, we have the biggest population. They only have a year left who are on the temporary status. They all came in legally. Um, and I just see this as, a, as sort of coming right up against our potential for unleashing our economy uh, because we're going to start having workforce shortages. And there's two ways to do this, training 
um, the kids that are growing up and retraining some workers, and then, of course, immigration reform. And could you comment on those two things? Well, well first of all, um, congratulations on the apprenticeship work. I, I'm a, a big fan of those sorts of efforts. I'd like to know more about it. Um, you know, I remind everyone who asks me about the immigration issue that the native-born U.S. population has fertility low enough that in the absence of immigration, the United States shrinks. Uh, we become Japan. We become smaller in population, smaller in economic size, smaller in our ability to protect our values and, and spread them around the globe. And, and so the flip side to that is that immigration reforms and policies are a huge economic opportunity and one that I think we should pursue vigorously. Mm -hmm. I, I am not uh, a big fan of what I see going on right now. I think we're going the wrong direction. Uh, and we ought to think hard about uh, legislation that would, in fact, um, put this on, more on an economic foundation, uh, right. both in terms of the long-term visa granting, but also in terms of the need for seasonal workers and, and sensible temporary worker programs that have, have uh, a real uh, effort at enforcement. Well, and as you know, in the comprehensive bill that passed the Senate with strong bipartisan support, we actually had worked out the ag issue with the migrant groups and the Farm Bureau and the Farmers Union, um, and that was something that was in there, um, which we would love to see today. Um, and I just look at it. I like uh, we had. I did a hearing here and um, uh, once on um, immigration reform, and we actually um, had Grover Norquist testify mm -hmm. in favor of immigration reform because he saw it as reducing uh, the debt because you'd have more people. Um, paying in by billions of dollars. So I just think it's a really important point to make as we go through. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on any of that. And it's just one of those issues that unites bearded right-wing crazies, and we thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Motre. Well, we have the Manufacturing Institute at the NAM, as you know, Senator, uh, which has really been specializing in trying to address that skills shortage. And, and as I noted earlier, it is our number one issue, and we go out and ask our members. As I travel around the country, I hear it everywhere, small, medium, and large in every state. Uh, and so we've been trying to do a number of things, including encouraging more women and vets, uh, yeah. as well as just trying to change perceptions. Mm -hmm. Any other? OK. Oh, Mr. Hampton, you want to get the last word, maybe? Our Minnesotan. Come on, Eric. Can we, just... <laughs> we have uh, found opportunities uh, to uh, employ people from uh, all walks of life. Uh, by just keeping our eyes open, and that mm -hmm. may mean uh, the local waitress who's showing something going to school, and uh, we give her an opportunity. As a matter of fact, that's a case in point. Uh, recently, we did hire somebody like that, and are bringing her along in an office environment where she uh, wasn't going to get an opportunity because she was a 40-year-old waitress. Mm -hmm. And just by going that direction and paying her a little more money, we now have an excellent employee. Good point. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Cruz, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would note to the senator from Minnesota talking about Texas and Minnesota rivalries that, that it appears likely now, or at least a good chance, that, that starting this weekend, the Houston Rockets will be facing the Minnesota Timberwolves in the NBA playoffs. And then, we so, hope that's true, yes. Uh, well, y'all are, but, but that per, per, perhaps we may have a side wager on the outcome if that, if that right. ends up being okay. the pairing. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Welcome. Th th thank you for being here. Um, as you guys know, on the tax reform bill, because it was passed on reconciliation, uh, some elements of it are scheduled to expire, uh, notably the individual tax cuts uh, and the expensing provisions. Uh, in your judgment, what impact does the expiration of those tax cuts have on likely future economic growth? And how would those projections be different if those elements of the tax cut uh, were permanent instead? I think you see those impacts in, in the CBO analysis, where there are, there are strong near-term impacts, and, and they diminish over the 10-year window. Permanent tax policy is always more powerful and better than temporary tax policy, and, and that, had it been possible, would have been a preferable route to go. I, I agree with that. I'm certainly, I think when you look at, from a manufacturing standpoint, the, the expensing provision is what really allows so much of the growth that we're seeing in, in this year and kind of moving forward. But we would like to have seen those be made permanent. We hope that they are made permanent at some point. Uh, <clears throat> the typical ap approach it would be for a company like ours, which is privately owned, for the proprietors to uh, increase their own wages in order to offset the increase in taxation. So if we want to maintain the benefit 
of the tax cuts to our corporation and retain money in that corporation, which is what we want to do, then the way to achieve it is certainly not to increase the personal tax. Uh, Senator Cruz, I think the uh, making the investment in centers permanent would make them more effective. However, it should be paid for. Um, it shouldn't be just run up on the the credit card of the of the nation. And and I, I disagree a little bit with your point about um, reconciliation requiring that. I think that it was basically a statement of priorities that you said you had one and a half trillion dollars, and you spend X on corporate stuff, Y on individual stuff, and the Y only lasts for seven years. So if Congress in 2018 were to revisit tax reform and make expensing and make the individual tax cuts permanent, uh, what would you expect the impact to be in terms of economic growth and jobs going forward? I think in and of itself it would be beneficial. Um, probably not large in the near term, but, but, but you'd get better out year projections. I think it would be even better if those were paired with uh, reforms to the mandatory spending program so that you didn't increase the deficit. That, that would be the sure. strongest economic sure. impact. Manufacturers are very long-term in their thinking. They're looking about investments that are gonna be, gonna be paying out many years down the line. And so I think that, uh, I agree with Doug. I think you're gonna see, especially in those outlying years, you're gonna see some really positive impacts from that. Our programs are, as we look at it uh, presently, we are looking towards a longer term future as a result of the tax cuts for aggressive uh, investment in the company. So if we look down the road and we're saying that there's going to be a reversal of these kind of things, it, it makes it uh, uh, more problematic for us to uh, set our plans. And uh, I just think there are gonna be plenty of opportunities for Congress to revisit this tax law that you have things that expire in 2019, 2022, 2025, there'll be plenty of opportunities to take a look at it and look at what our fiscal situation is and, and make the necessary adjustments. Uh, shifting topics to, to regulatory reform. Uh, if Congress were to pass uh, structural regulatory reform, something like the RAINS Act, uh, which provides that any economic regulation that imposes over $100 million of cost on the economy can't go into effect without an affirmative up-down vote from Congress. Uh, what would each of you expect to be the impact on the economy, on economic growth and jobs if, if the RAINS Act were enacted? As I said in, in my uh, opening remarks, the, the, the burden of regulation of over $100 billion a year for eight years, I think, has been an important impact on the economy. And to, to have a statutory check on that would be, be an enormous benefit. I, I wish we had better sort of empirical estimates for the research literature. We don't, but it is certainly uh, directionally an important thing to do. So manufacturers certainly are responding to the changed environment and, and, and recognizing that the rulemaking process is different. The two in, you know, two, uh, two out for whatever one coming in, I think is a, is a completely different uh, ball game. Uh, and uh, certainly I think they would react very favorably to continued changes in, in the positive direction for, for, for regulations. Um, I don't know enough about the RAINS Act to have a, a well-formed opinion on, on that, so I think I'll pass. Okay. Very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And with that, I want to thank all of our witnesses for taking the time to be with us uh, here today and remind members that should they wish to submit questions for the record, the hearing record will remain open for five business days. And with that, our committee is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>